This is about paths to God, and I'm going to begin with my own path, a little bit of my own experience. I did go to a Catholic grade school and Catholic high school, a Jesuit high school, but I won't talk about that now. One of the defining experiences happened in uh, 1972. I had purchased this book. I lived around Washington, D.C. I visited Philadelphia, where, my parent, where I grew up, where my parents were. And around Christmas, I found saw this book in a bookstore, and I bought it. And sometime in January, I started to read it. And I had two roommates, but one of them happened to be away skiing, and the other one was away on business. And I was by myself, and I started to read it, and at some point, something happened. Now, here's an account of a woman we've seen before. I saw the supernal light. It was a light, but it wasn't like normal light. It was, it was holy. It was God, or it was at least something very intense. And it lasted for about 10 days, off and on. I was working a job where I worked from 4 to 12, and people left at 5 o'clock. So I don't know if I could have kept it together the whole day. But I was able to go into work, keep to myself for an hour. People would leave, and then it would kind of explode, and it would get very intense. And I can't say more than that. I guess I could say one, one thing. I remember once being kind of tired, like I, it, was, it was too intense, and I tried to kind of come down, and I turned on the TV, and my mind started racing. I remember having a thought, and it was that there were three levels of reality. There was me in a room watching a TV. It was in my bedroom. That, that, that was level number one. Level number two was the cowboy on the horse with the gun. The level number three was what was actually on TV was the record of an actor who maybe in California 10 years previously had put on those clothes and got on a horse and been filmed. And then there was another thought and another and another. And, but eventually it, it faded. And later in 1972, this guru was in Washington. A lot of publicity. It was the whole of the Daughters of the American Revolution, if I remember correctly. So I and one of my roommates went to see him. And I was unimpressed. I mean, it was like, okay, it's fine for some people, but didn't impress me. I moved back to Philadelphia and I was trying to meditate and I just, I was living by myself and I was working and I kept seeing advertisements of, of, of this guru's followers. And the way it worked is you'd go to someone's home and they called it satsang. I think Christians would call it witnessing. You'd sit around and people would tell you how wonderful the guru was or some of his teachings or some of their experiences. And I remember the first time I went, there was this remote, remote farmhouse. It was on a land, I believe, that had been purchased to build Six Flags Great Adventure in New Jersey. And um, there was a, a couple living there, renting it, I believe. They didn't own it. And it was so remote, I drove up in my Volkswagen Beetle, and I remember walking to the door and thinking, in any movie, even if it wasn't a horror movie, the audience would be saying, don't go in, don't go in. But I went in, and it was fine. And I got to see after a while of going to these things that some people were very emotional. When they spoke, ah, the guru, oh, I just feel so wonderful, and yesterday I was feeling bad, but I remembered he said this, and that made me feel so good. And so it was a little feeling. And other people, I remember one person said something to the effect of, a Buddha teaches that desires lead to suffering. And a few days ago, and then he mentioned some occasion of his suffering and how he had analyzed it and saw how his desire had led to that unpleasantness or whatever. So I got to see that people were very different. Of course, we knew that anyway. But I mean, in the spiritual world, there were people who were driven mostly by emotion or mostly by... Of course, there were people who had to blend. But I got to see that. But what attracted me, uh, I, I was with this group maybe for four or five months, was I was hearing stuff like this. And these, these are quotes. I wrote this in 73. I, I, I was thinking maybe they'd use it as a flyer, but they never did. But I kept my copy. It's the only copy there was. God is energy, energy which cannot be created or destroyed. The basis of, on the basis of that, this whole world is existing. This knowledge is pure and perfect energy. Now, knowledge is what the Guru's term was, for he claimed he could give you a mystical experience of this pure and perfect energy, which I'd already had, and I thought, well, this is amazing. He's talking about that, and I thought that was very interesting. 
You might, you might have seen this book. It was kind of big for a little while. He was getting publicity. And, but by about, oh, September of 73 or whatever, I had stopped going, except I'd go now and then. But they had this big gathering in um, Houston in November. And there was a woman I'd been friendly with and interested in, and she was going, so I went. But basically, I, I stopped um, participating pretty much in that. I'd go now and then to a meeting, but I dropped off a lot. But uh, the experience that I had had in uh, reading that book uh, lasted well, till, till this day. That's one reason I'm doing this. Um, oh, I don't mean it lasted that I, I, I kept the experience. The, the, the effect of the experience lasted. The experience is mostly gone, unfortunately, sadly. Maybe it comes back before you die, I don't know. Maybe, but anyway. But I remember in about 78, now this is a quote we've seen before by St. Augustine. The eye of his soul, he saw the light unchangeable, not an ordinary light. He that knows the truth knows this light. Thou art my God. I had that printed up in 1978, I believe, and I sent it out as a Christmas card. And so it had, it had a, a had a lasting effect on my life. Now let's get into ways of God. In an earlier video clip, I mentioned that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in Christianity often depicted as an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a man or an angel. And the idea is ox represents body, lion represents emotion. Think of a roaring lion. Eagle represents intellect, like you're high above and you're surveying the whole area. And the man or the angel represents the soul. And this division occurs in Hinduism, too, and they give names for these four ways of going to God. Now, by the way, the way of the body, well, I'll get to that. So here is four yogas, as they're called. Karma yoga is the way of action. That's the way of the body. Bhakti is the devotion. Those were the people who would just speak mostly about their emotions. The way of knowledge. That's the philosophical way. That's basically what we're doing now. And this I've seen described as the way of consciousness or the soul. Here they don't have that. But uh, some people break up the yogas into six parts. Some people go further. I'm not an expert on yogas. But it's interesting that that original one, corresponds with the four parts of the human body and the four evangelists in Christianity. So, oh, in that group I was in, there were people, I'm sure, who would sit for those satsangs, but probably felt impatient. They wanted to get out and do something. And in Christianity, that could be typified by the Salvation Army. These are people doing stuff, running uh, soup kitchens or thrift stores and collecting money around Christmas. They're actually doing stuff. And uh, for intellect, well, uh, the Jesuits have been known for being pretty intellectual and philosophical, although that's not the only Catholic tradition, I'm sure, but I did go to a Jesuit high school, and I would agree that they, they did seem to be that way. They give you a solid education. A lot of the people who went to that high school became doctors or judges or whatever, or attorneys. Uh, but, uh, of course, there's, there's other Catholic traditions that emphasize the intellect. For emotion, my mother was a, very devoted to Mary. And in my experience in Catholicism, I don't think many Catholics are devoted to God the Father or the Holy Spirit. I know that some charismatic Christians uh, believe they experience the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and being slain in the Holy Spirit and all that. I don't think that exists too much in Catholicism, but I think in Catholicism, the Catholics that I've met have been devoted to Jesus and especially to Mary, uh, in my experience. So that's uh, emotion. You feel a love for the uh, personification, for the God who is a person. Feel very closeness to them. And lastly, centering prayer. Well, in Christianity, there was and uh, this man, Thomas Keating, who I met once, a monk, attempted to revive the, uh, you might call it the, uh, the, the Raja Yoga, the, the way of concentration, of, of working with your consciousness. And uh, there is uh, Thomas Keating, the, the monk calls it centering prayer, and here it's intimacy with God. Here's a quote by him once, not thinking, you're not thinking, see it's, uh, the idea is you're not philosophizing, you're getting, you're, you're ignoring your rational mind, and you're trying to actually feel 
the presence of God. And I think that would be that fourth way. Here he is again. It seems like he met the Dalai Lama. I believe this is him. It came up on a search of Thomas Keating. And in the Christian tradition, there's a lot of books that uh, have spoken about uh, meditation. This is The Cloud of Unknowing. It talks about putting all thoughts out of your mind and raising above your thoughts and basically trying to have an experiential knowledge of God. Here's a book that has an interesting history. It was very popular, and then it was condemned by the Catholic Church. But it, this also talks about, uh, I think it was condemned because uh, at one point in the book, it said that things like statues and uh, uh, incense and, and golden vest, uh, chalices and might be a hindrance at one point. The idea was you go inward and you have a direct experience of God, and if you're concentrating on his outward things, it could be a hindrance at a certain point of your spiritual life. And uh, maybe that's why the church didn't like it, but I don't know. You could look it up. And that's basically what I had to say for today, a little bit of my life and um, a description of four ways that people attempt to get closer to God. So thanks for listening.